I need him for everything. He's uh, my savior and my friend and my confidant and everything. Jesus means everything. Jesus is my treasure. Without Jesus, I'm nothing. He is my life and my purpose. He knows me inside and out, and I feel most comfortable when I'm in His presence because I can reveal my whole heart to Him. He's, he's everything. He is um, my comforter, my light, my direction. He's my all in all. His love is uh, uh, beyond any explanation as far as human terms and ability to put it in a value. Um, Jesus Christ is my rock and my refuge. He is what comforts me. He's what sustains me. Um, he's taught me that most recently in my life. That, that's what I would say first when I think about Jesus Christ. He's my rock. Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, my rock. He's my everything. He is my daily bread. He is my all in all, my everything. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's the love of my life. In John chapter 6, Jesus is in a highly unpopulated area on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. A huge crowd followed him and due to their long journey and lack of food, Jesus asked one of his disciples, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? A young boy nearby had five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus took what the boy had, gave thanks for it, and distributed enough food for 5,000 with 12 baskets of bread fragments left over. Excitement burst across the crowd as they tried to take him by force and make him king. But Jesus sent them away. He went up on the mountain to be alone. The next day on the other side of the sea, the crowd saw Jesus and once again followed after him. Jesus pointedly said to them, You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. The crowd then pressed him to tell them how to get this bread, which they assumed was much like the manna given from God to the nation of Israel during their wilderness wanderings following the exodus from Egypt. Jesus was once again very straightforward with them. He told them that he was not talking about earthly bread, but something bigger for a bigger need. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He goes on to say, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. This was highly offensive, especially in the Jewish culture. In fact, it was so hard that the Bible says from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And he was left with the twelve. People sought Jesus because he was doing things for them. He appeared to be a great leader, perhaps someone who could actually overthrow the Roman Empire and bring Israel freedom. He healed their sick. He fed them with miraculous provision of food. He met their physical needs. And what Jesus said to them was very profound. He was saying, yes, I've done all of these things for you, but these things are not the main point. 
I can heal you, but you'll still die. I can give you food, but you'll still be hungry. I know you have needs, but you have one need you have not yet acknowledged. One need that requires more than physical healing, more than food, more than a military leader. So what is that need? To find that, we must go back to the very beginning, back to Adam and Eve. Adam was created simply to enjoy God. God created the earth, all the animals and the vegetation of the earth, set man in the midst of it, and then he invited him to the greatest joy of all, the ability to enjoy the presence of his Creator in God. However, sin entered when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, and it plunged all of mankind under a dark curse. We all inherit a sin nature because of their action. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Through one man, that is Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, God could no longer walk with man like He did with Adam. God is holy, meaning He's perfect without sin. He's altogether different from His creation. Habakkuk chapter 1 says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. His holiness is complete. It's perfect. And in the light of His holiness, what may not be so bad to us is proven to be hideous. Romans chapter 3 says of all men, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. But you see, God's also just, meaning that because He is holy, He must be a perfect judge against anything not in line with His holiness. Psalm 7 says, God is a righteous judge. So we, as descendants of Adam and Eve, are in a very dangerous position before God. When we see our sin in the light of God's holiness, then the rightness of His justice becomes clear. Every lie we've ever told, every impure thought we've ever had, every time we've not given God the reverence and honor He deserves, are just a few symptoms of the problems of this sin nature. Your sin, my sin, no matter how small it may seem, is a direct assault on the authority and throne of God. By our actions, we shake our fist at our Creator and say, I know you created me, but you have no right over me. I'm my own God and I will not bring myself under your ways. I will follow my own. God's justice demands payment. If justice was not served and sin dealt with, then God would cease to be holy. And we are all the targets of His justice because of our sin. You see, Genesis 18 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Can you see this need that Jesus was getting at? Yes, you need food. Yes, you need bread. But both you and the bread will one day perish, and that bread will not be of any help to you. You'll stand before the holiness of God, and His justice will require a payment. And it's a payment you can never complete. It will require a continuous payment in hell forever. Your sin was against an eternal God. Therefore, it requires an eternal price. What do we need? We need a payment for our sin. It's a payment we cannot make. And we also need righteousness. Listen to Psalm 24. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, 
who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Who of us can say this? None of us. We're doomed. But Jesus came to accomplish this for us. He fulfilled righteousness. He, as a man, accomplished perfect obedience in his life, and through his sacrificial death, Payment for sin was complete. A transaction between God and Jesus took place, and justice was fully served, served in Christ. Isaiah prophesying about Jesus said, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Before time, a plan was put forth that Jesus, God in the flesh, would bear the burden of the penalty of our sins and offer us his righteousness. It's an offer from God to mankind. Christ purchased it, Christ accomplished it, and Christ offers it freely to us. When Jesus preached, he said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Turn from your sin and turn to me. Place your faith in me. Trust me. Place your life in my hands. Relinquish control to me and be saved. Jesus paid it all. By faith, you are forgiven. By faith, you're just before God. This is certainly good news, which is what the word gospel means. We can stand before God with justice over our sin, fully served and clothed in the righteousness needed to be acceptable to God. But as being forgiven and right before God the fullness of what Jesus meant when he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. There's something of a deeper satisfaction here. Bread was precious in Jesus' day. Typically, a man worked for wages that would pay for his family's food that day and that day only. True, the purpose of bread is for mere survival. It keeps a physical body alive. But there is a deeper satisfaction that comes with food. There is a visceral craving, hunger, and desire for food, and that food pleases, it soothes, it satisfies. God, through Jesus, is not just making us justified before Him, just for the sake of being justified. He's restoring to Himself a people that will walk with Him and know Him intimately. If you remember, Adam was created to walk with God and enjoy Him. Through Jesus, God restores to you and I this source of ultimate satisfaction, Himself. Are you experiencing that joy? Is that what Christ means to you right now? So many people today are professing a gospel that just rids them of the penalty of hell. Christ died for something much, much more. 
that you would be blown away by His beauty and His glory. That's why He uses bread as a metaphor. The physical sense of taste. Something that you experience. He used another metaphor in John 6. And this is the will of God that everyone that sees the Son and believes in Him has everlasting life. He uses the physical sense of seeing. Why? Because Jesus is something to be experienced, not just believed about, but to be encountered. I never will forget when my father-in-law was converted and he said to me, why didn't you tell me it was this good? The fact was we had. It's just this, when you encounter Christ, He's far better than anything you've ever heard so that you can proclaim the half has not yet been told. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. Did Jesus die to keep us from hell? Yes. But beyond that, He, the fullness of God in the flesh, came to bring us to God. He is the end. He's the goal. He's our treasure. And when we look at the gifts in His hands and see the forgiveness, heaven, eternal life, perfected bodies, and then we look up to the One holding those gifts, we see that only because of who He is can the gifts be made real. And our hearts jump with pleasure over not only the gifts, but also the gift giver. There's a satisfaction simply in who He is. This is why we say, Jesus is the Gospel. The Gospel's not just about Jesus. The Gospel is Jesus. The power within the facts of the Gospel come only from who Jesus is. His value, His worth, make the facts of the Gospel come alive with meaning and truth. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, describe grace. And how you describe uh, an eternity with somebody that loves you that much. Mm.